I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to Impact Cyber Church. Man, today I've got some great stuff for you. We're going to be talking about the heart, but we're going to be talking about specific aspects of the heart. Have you ever heard somebody make the expression, man, that person just walked all over me? And you know what they're talking about. They're saying basically they walked on their heart, so to speak, and it, and it affected them. It affected them deeply. Well, you know something? That concept comes out of the Bible. It's amazing how many concepts we have that comes out of the Bible. You know, you hear the saying, what goes around comes around. That comes out of the book of Proverbs. There are so many of our colloquialisms that actually came out of the Bible. But today we're going to talk about what happens when your heart is negatively affected, whether it happened before you got saved or after you got saved, and, and it's still affecting you today and what you can do about it. And that's the key thing. And I want you to know God is deeply interested in the condition of your heart. He wants you he wants you at peace. He wants you feeling loved. He wants you feeling safe. He wants you to have a sense of identity. I am telling you, God wants your heart to be whole and well and healed. As a matter of fact, when Jesus launched into the ministry, right out of the chute, his, his first message coming out of the chute was in Luke 4, 18, where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to them that are blind and set at liberty those who are bruised or who are oppressed uh, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, many of you have heard me teach on this before, so, but don't, don't turn me off because I'm going to share some things with you that I have really not shared before. You know, so many times in these broadcasts, we can only share so much. And man, I, you know, people contact me all the time. They say, you're overloading me with information in this broadcast. Well, I try, to, I try to keep it palatable, but there's always more because there is no end to the wisdom of God's Word. Let me talk just a minute about the characteristics of a broken heart. You know, your heart is your seat of identity, your, seat, your sense of who you are. As we've said hundreds of times, your heart <clears throat> is where your soul and your spirit come together, overlap or whatever kind of term or merge, whatever kind of terms that you would want to use. And because it's a combination of, of your natural man and your spiritual man, it's a combination of your soul and your spirit, then it's a combination of what you're getting from your five senses in the world and what you're choosing to believe from those five senses, as well as what you're getting from your five spiritual senses that are opening uh, your eyes to God and to uh, the invisible realm of the kingdom of God. But all of that comes together, and, and see, neither your soul or your spirit is the real you, because you are more than that. And, but when you bring your soul and your spirit together, this is the real you. And <clears throat> to whatever degree you bring your soul, your thoughts, your thinking, your emotions in line with the spiritual side of your heart, uh, the spirit side, uh, and see yourself the way God sees you, then the more that identity becomes absolute and the more that identity actually drives your life. Most of the things that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to win the battle by faith. We're trying to get to where I can overcome this sin, overcome this temptation or solve this problem or, or fix this part of my life. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but really the way we should approach that is from the sense of establishing our heart and who God is and who we are. Now, a fractured sense of identity is, is where, you know, I'll talk to people all the time and they're, they're kind of lost. They, they don't know for, you know, if you don't know what you want to do with your life, then the real truth is you probably don't know who you are. And I'm not saying, I'm not putting you down, I'm not criticizing you, but when a person is clear about their identity, then that identity drives them and what they do with their life is just a natural expression of that identity. You know, another uh, interesting characteristics of people who have a broken heart is uh, they'll very often get excited about something, really stirred up and passionate, and they're able to, they're able to kind of see something uh, that they haven't seen before, and, and they know that there's promises of God, they know there's a future and a destiny for them, but they just can't follow through 
to the fulfillment or to the manifestation. It's, you know, I, I had one person that I, I used to teach with years ago, and, and he would make this statement. He'd say, you know, a broken heart is like having a crack in a bucket where you fill it with water and the water just slowly drips out. And that's what happens. You know, God will fill our heart or our vision or our passion will fill our heart and bam, the next thing you know, uh, it, it, just little by little, we have lost that passion and that desire. Another characteristic of a broken heart is when we have repeated cycles of negative emotions. In other words, when you're having to fight to think positive, that's not normal. You know, when you're having to fight to be optimistic and hopeful about the future, that is not normal. Now, that may be normal based on what society is doing. That is not normal for a believer. Remember, the word righteousness, and we referred to this, I think, last week. You know, the word righteousness, even though it has all sorts of, uh, of expanded concepts and meanings, on a functional level, the word righteousness basically means as it should be. So uh, how should it be if you know that God is your father? How should it be if you know that all your sins are forgiven? How should it be if you know you're loved and accepted and approved of God? How should it be you know, emotionally if you know that all the promises that God has ever made to anyone, the answer is yes, if you want them in your life. How should it be for you if you know that you're delivered from all of the curses of the law? Well, I'll tell you how it should be. You should be happy. You should have peace. You should have joy. And, and so, so since righteousness is supposed to be our, our core nature, and, and remember, don't, I'm not talking about just religious, no religious righteousness, in fact. And I'm not talking about just uh, in the sense of, of how we behave. I'm talking about how we feel, how our health is, how all those things are. So, so how should I be if, 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 if my heart is actually righteous? Well, it shouldn't be filled with negative emotions. I shouldn't find myself having to fight to, to uh, have better emotions. Now, if you are, don't condemn yourself. If you are, I am not putting you down and I am not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying we need to get your heart made whole. You know, when your heart's been broken, there can be a, a feeling of, of being unqualified uh, uh, sort of like, kind of a feeling like, you know, all the good stuff is for somebody else. But, you know, for me, it just doesn't go that way. You know, that sense of a, the black cloud over your head and just the expectation of things going wrong. That can't happen in a heart that is whole. Also, um, uh, when a heart has been broken, one of the biggest things is the way it affects you in relationships and the inability to give and receive love. And then, of course, obviously, when a heart is broken, there is that inability to trust because faith is a matter of the heart. And it even goes beyond the inability to trust. It gets into the inability to know who to trust. You know, uh, many of you have heard me talk about, about my dog and you, you, some of you have been here at uh, World Changer Weekend or Heart Physics Weekend where I'd bring him out and, and, and let him meet people. Well, you know, in, in, in learning to, to train a dog is, is very interesting. But in learning to train a dog, um, you want to let a dog sniff a lot, like smell of things. And so when some people are training a dog and walking your dog is one of the most important places where you train them and how you walk them and how you interact with them when you walk them. And so in walking a dog, many times people get so rigid that, that you know, the, the dog has to stay right there beside of them, right exactly where he's supposed to be. And I'm not against this. I'm not saying anybody's wrong for doing this. But that dog really doesn't interact much with their environment. And many times that dog will begin to depend on his sight more than his smell which is really not normal for a dog. Because there are so many things that a dog perceives through smell that we, we, we can't even understand. But I heard uh, 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 the dog whisperer, one of my favorite dog trainers, say one time, he said, he said a dog that stops relying on their smell can be a dangerous dog. Because stop and think about it. When a dog is looking at you, you're bigger than him. And you're approaching him and you're standing up over him. And so, from, from the eye, it looks like a threat. But if that dog, if that dog had kept his senses alive uh, through use, 
then he would, have, he would have sniffed, he would have smelled, and he would have made a decision about you being a threat based on something other than his eyes. Well, you know, I, I want you to understand something. We have other senses other than, other than seeing, hearing, and touching. We have other senses that are completely different. They're not reliant on the flesh or not reliant on what this process that we call the nervous system and, and the physical body. But the problem is we have forgotten how to use them. We're like that dog that never goes out and sniffs. You know, when I take my dog out, now that you know, I taught him how to walk beside of me, I taught him how to obey me, now I take him out on a long leash. And when I say come, he comes. And when I say turn uh, this way, he goes this way. When I say wait, he waits on me. And if I want him to walk right there beside me, he does. And I did that deliberately because, man, I want him sniffing everything. I want him to know the world oh, the way a dog is supposed to. Well, let me tell you something. We need to know the world the way a believer is supposed to. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about, you know, we, we, don't, we don't look at the appearance of things. Well, you know, the question is, what do you look at? Well, if, if you don't have your heart developed to see with the eyes of your heart, then I got news for you. Uh, you're just relying on your five senses. Let's, let, let's look, let, let me say something, by the way, about that scripture. Remember, Jesus started his ministry of ministering to the heart and the need, the necessity for you to get your heart healed because the truth is it doesn't matter what truth you believe. If you've got a broken heart, it, that truth is not going to work for you. Uh, let's read this scripture again. I'm going to go through it pretty fast because we've got a lot to, to cover. Isaiah 61, 1. And you know, I always love to go back. You know, in, in the Greek, there are things that were lost in the translation from the Hebrew to the Greek. And so uh, uh, these scriptures, these Old Testament scriptures uh, that we have in the Hebrew, we can get a closer concept to what God was really saying many times than we can in the Greek New Testament. And I've studied Greek for, for uh, 40, well, actually 45 years. I started studying Greek within just a couple of months after I, after I got saved and, uh, and I've never quit. But I, but, so I'm not putting down the Greek. I'm not negative about the Greek, but I'm just saying there are things you can see in the Hebrew that you cannot see in the Greek. So Isaiah 61, same passage of Scripture, says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Now, now that, that concept of being poor, it, it's, it's a picture of someone that is crouched down with their hands out. And it's not so much that they are a beggar, as much as it is, they are receptive. They are a person who recognizes their need. You see, you can't give something or anything to someone whose cup is full. You know, when you, you, know, when, when you look at the Hebrew alphabet and you go through the story that it tells in each, in, in each letter, uh, very early in the Hebrew alphabet, it brings you to, to this, this concept where one of the letters puts an emphasis, it's called the tet. It, it puts the emphasis on uh, letting the Lord examine your heart. You know, this psalmist said that, search my heart, God, and see if there be any wicked ways in me. And, you know, many people today, they, they, they reject that kind of verse. They think that's being negative or introspective. No, it's not. It's being transparent. It's being open. It's being surrendered and, and saying, God, if there's anything in me that, that is not going to bring me to a better relationship with you, better relationship with the people around me, to a, to a better relationship with myself. If there's anything in me that's not going to bring me to, to all that I am in Jesus, I want it, I want it out of me. Well, what's, what's interesting is the very next letter is the, is the, is the uh, calf, and it looks like a cup turned sideways. And Basically, that's saying once you allow the Lord to search your heart and you're willing to empty yourself, then your cup is empty and now you have the opportunity to fill your cup with something. Well, the very next letter is what's called the Lamet. And the Lamet, it looks like an L, it actually looks like a lightning bolt if you want to know the truth. And the Lamet has to do it's a picture of a person who, all right, I want God to, I, I, I empty myself. I wanted God to search my heart. So now I am on my knees with my hands raised and I am seeking God with all my heart. I am that person that, that it says here uh, that he's come to preach to the poor. I am that person who says, I want my heart filled 
with all that you are. I, I, I want to see myself, the world, everything in the world, you know, the way, the way you do. And uh, by the way, it's really interesting. It says that he came to preach good news or good tidings to the poor. Real interesting thing. You know, the, the Apostle John warns us that the, that the doctrine of the Antichrist will deny that Jesus literally became a man, that he came in the flesh with a normal body and that he, that he emptied himself and that everything he did, he did as a man full of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'll tell you something. You can't believe how much of the church world denies that today. You can't believe how many, you know, they dance around it. It's like, yeah, he became a man, but he was 100% God. He was 100% man. And they think he did miracles because he was the son of God. No, he did miracles because he was the son of man. But what's really interesting is the word good news or the word gospel in the, in the Hebrew actually means and can be translated as flesh. So all the way back in the, in, in the Old Testament, we, we have this understanding that the good news, the gospel was going to have something to do with the Messiah coming in the flesh. Now listen to this. It says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now that word brokenhearted, of course, means broken, maimed, crippled, broken down, or to burst open like a water jug. And ba you know, basically it's just saying, you know, your heart, which is the seed of your being, is, is crippled. It, it just doesn't function right, your ability to love, to trust, to, to have relationships, your ability to see yourself as God says you are is just fractured. And he says, but I've come to proclaim, I've also come to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now it's interesting when you look up the word captives in the Hebrew, and remember every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has its own definition and tells a story. Captives are people where even though they're taken captive, they have a passion to fill themselves with the presence of God. And right now, that passion is leading them to fill themselves with something else. You know, uh, the letter that represents the presence of God in the Hebrew alphabet is the hay. And the hay, it, it, it looks like, like a, 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 a three-sided rectangle with, with a little hole in the corner top. And that, that little hole in the corner top represents the, uh, uh, the narrow gate, the way, you know, coming, uh, coming in through the narrow gate. The bottom is open and it represents the wide gate. And you remember when Jesus was talking about, about the, the, the wide gate, wide is the gate or the path that leads to destruction. Well, you see, these people have a passion, and the problem is they are filling that passion with something that leads to destruction. But interestingly, once they trust the Lord, once they turn to the Lord, all of that passion for life and for happiness that's being filled in a destructive way suddenly turns, and that passion moves them toward God and, and, and inspires them to seek God. So... So literally, it, it, it's turning from a passion for seeking the ways of the world and turning immediately to, to the knowledge of God and repentance. That, that literally has a letter in there that means to, to change your direction and to change your ways and to change you know, your mind and to change your opinions. You know, it's amazing to me how many people today are negative about repentance. They talk about repentance as if it's something bad. Well, you know, religion did turn repentance into something bad. Religion did make repentance something negative and something destructive, but uh, God never made it destructive. So we, we, why should we throw it away just because religion messed it up? You know, I, if, if I am driving in the wrong direction, I'm not going where my map is, has told me to go. I've taken a wrong turn. I have to make another turn to reach the destination that I want to make. What's wrong with that? What's negative about that? It's not about focusing on what's wrong with you. It's about saying, where do I want to go? It focuses on the direction that I want to take. And then he goes on to say, and the opening of the, of the prison to those who are bound. Well, that word bound gets into the idea of being yoked to something. Well, keep in mind, that apart from God or backslidden in God, we're yoked to sin and death. Now, people quote the verse and they say, well, you know, Christ has delivered me from the law of sin and death. Well, if you put that in context, that's true when we walk in the Spirit. That is true when we yield to God. And it doesn't mean 
the law of sin and death has been canceled because in the book of Romans where Paul talks about that, he makes it clear that, you know, even though you're saved and you keep sinning, it's still going to kill you. The point is because you, the yoke has been broken that makes you have to sin, that, that where you can't see in other way, you're free from the power of sin. Therefore, you're free from the death that sin brings. So you break that yoke and, and you know, that brings you to the place where you are free in the Lord. You're free from the prison. You're free from the yoke to pursue the life that God actually has for you. And he goes on and says, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Man, that's a year of jubilee where all, and in this case, all emotional and spiritual debt is paid. And he says, and the day of vengeance of our God. Many people look at that and go, oh, I don't want to read that. Well, let me tell you something. When the Antichrist comes to power, you're going to be glad that there's a day of vengeance. You're going to be glad that there's a day that God says, I am delivering you and I'm delivering planet earth, just like he did in the days of Noah. See, we look at, we look at the days of Noah and think how mean was God. Well, I'll tell you what, God was delivering the world from the Nephilim. He was delivering the world uh, because there was the bloodline of salvation was about to be lost and, and it had to be preserved in Noah and there was nobody else to preserve it. And God had to, God had to preserve the salvation of the world by wiping out a world that had become so ungodly that their only intention was to snuff out Noah and make it impossible for salvation to come to the world. And then he says, to comfort all who mourn. Man, I love that. Let me tell you something. If you're mourning, see, if you're mourning from a broken heart, if you're hurting, God wants to comfort you and to console those who mourn and to give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for your mourning, the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness that you might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Man, alive. I tell you, what's, you know, there's nothing bad in that. Nothing whatsoever. But all of that is contingent upon God being able to heal your heart. You know, there's an interesting scripture in the book of Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, the ninth verse. And in the King James, it reads like this. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I'll tell you what, that's not even close to what this says in the original language. I, I, you know, I, I can remember back, you know, 25 years ago when I first started teaching this, maybe 30 years ago when I first started teaching what I'm about to tell you now, I'm telling you people would just lose their minds and tell me I was crazy and didn't know what I was talking about. But then I would say, did you, did you look it up in a concordance? Well, no, but I know what it means. Well, look it up in a concordance. And I can't tell you how many people call me back and say, man, it is exactly what you're saying. You see, now we've been born again. Our heart shouldn't be wicked. But what it actually says here, it says that, our heart is covered in footprints and causes it to function in a corrupt way. Or, you know, I, I hate to use the word wicked because of how, we, of how we think about that word. You see, I said at the beginning of the program, this, this phrase you hear people say, so that person just walked all over me. Well, I'll tell you something, that, that's biblical. Because, see, we have experiences in our life where people walk on our heart. Now, there's only one cure for a broken heart. Number one, that's a new heart, or if you're already a believer. And see, sadly, as believers, when we don't follow God's wisdom, we can end up with a broken heart again. Well, when we do, even though God's already gave, given us a new heart, He still wants to heal that heart. And He will heal your heart, I'll tell you. And you know, you can, you can do all this stuff by yourself. You can learn how to connect with God by yourself. Uh, but if you do, you're probably going to be like me. It's, you're probably going to spend decades learning how to, learning how to meditate on, on the truth of God's Word, learning how to experience God in your heart. But you know something? Now listen, this is so important. I have a tool that I developed. I spent 30 years developing this tool called Heart Physics. And the goal of this tool was to get people where they could hear and experience God in their heart. Because our hope of glory is Christ in, in me. That's, that's the hope of my glory. That's the only reason I have to believe that I can be God-like and, and, and live in righteousness and have the new covenant and healing and health and all that kind of stuff is, is, is because of Christ in me. 
But if I, if I can't recognize Christ in me, if I can't sense him, His direction, His leadership, then you know what? He might as well not be there. He might help me eternally when I leave planet Earth. But I got news for you. You know, the Bible's concept of heaven has nearly nothing to do with after you die, even though that's a big bonus. Most of, like the kingdom of heaven, is something that we live here now in this life. And so, you know, I developed this tool, spent a million dollars developing it, and, and like I say, about 30 years of, of personal use and use it in my clinic and use it in my counseling. And, and so because of how much it costs to put this together, it, it, it costs us to, to put it out. And so we provide it $299 a month. But you know something? I got together with, with some of my guys and we were talking a few weeks ago and they said, look, we, we've got to find a way to take heart physics to the world. So you know something? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take about a $250,000 loss. I calculated it uh, uh, since our last program. Probably a $250,000 loss here so that I can put heart physics in your hand and for about $29. And the truth is, every single day for the next 30 days, I'm going to give you uh, a daily short lesson. I'm going to give you a daily heart physics meditation that you can do. I'm going to give you some other tools that are going to help you be able to make this journey. And I'm going to create an online commun closed community just for people who are going through heart physics so that I can actually answer your questions and personally coach you for the next month. And I got news for you. You do this at the end of a month Yes, there are exceptions to what I'm about to say, but very few. You do this and at the end of the month, you're going to be able to recognize Christ in you. You're going to have personal experiences and you're going to begin to hear His voice. And, and I'm telling you, the testimonies from thousands of people doing heart physics are just beyond anything I've ever seen at any altar call anywhere in the world. And multi multiply, you know, I can multiply everything I've seen through preaching to millions of people. Uh, I can multiply that exponentially by the results I've seen in heart physics. So listen, moveyourboundaries.com or go to my website, impactministries.com and, and check out Impact Unlimited, and we're going to give you the opportunity to go through heart physics, personal coaching, daily teaching, put you on a journey to get you in touch with Jesus so He can heal your heart. And I'm going to tell you something, we're going to be posting a lot more of our heart physics testimonies so that you can read about what's happening in the lives of other people. I just want you to participate. I want you to get whole. I, I don't know what else I can do to make this available to you, but you want to jump in because we're only going to have a short time that you can get in and then it's going to be closed because we want everybody going through this together at the same pace. Listen, be sure if you're watching on YouTube at the end of this to like and subscribe to this, to this program. Uh, we want to be a blessing to people all over the world. Listen, I'll be talking to you again next week with something special.